Hello and welcome. There we go. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Building Global Bridges, Enhancing International Education Partnerships in Indian Institutions. My name is Rebecca Bendel, and over the next 45 minutes, I'll be drawing on our expert panelists to provide. Rebecca, we can't hear you. Apologies, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me again. Thank you, Amrita. Uh, so I encourage you to submit your questions by the Q&A and I'll do my best to ask them as they come through. Um, before I introduce my panellists, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Acumen. We're part of the SANMS4 group and are a leading provider of international market entry and expansion solutions. We specialize in assisting organizations to navigate the complexities of entering new markets. Acumen offers a range of services, including market research, regulatory compliance, in-country representation, lead to enrollment solutions, and strategic advisory. With a focus on Southeast Asia, South Asia and North America, Acumen helps partners establish a strong presence and achieve sustainable growth in their target markets. We leverage our extensive network and expertise, enabling businesses to overcome challenges and seize opportunities in a diverse and dynamic global landscapes. So to our webinar, let me introduce you our wonderful experts. Professor Bhavna Kumar, with over 30 years of diverse experience, Bhavna has been a pivotal force in institution building international collaborations, academic administration, accreditations, project management, consultancy, research, teaching, and training. She has excelled as an institution builder, educationist, researcher, trainer, innovator, and management consultant. Bhavna is the project director for transnational education at Acumen and spearheads our project with the Australian Department of Education. Her role involves providing strategic insights, guidance, and hands-on support for market entry establishment, expansion, and growth within Indian education sector. Additionally, she meticulously crafts cutting-edge academic and learning content spanning various sectors, modes, and domains. As a certified coach, Bhavna has facilitated over 150 training programs, workshops, and management development programs. Topics covered included t and &E, in action, man sorry, management in action, strategy, career development, behavioral skills, conflict management, leadership, motivation, among others. So welcome, Bhavna. Uh, and next we have Amrita Gulati. A true advocate for education, Amrita's passion lies in unlocking the doors to higher learning, exploring diverse academic journeys and cultivating avenues for growth and enrichment of students. With a robust history in teaching, high school career and college counselling at the Sri Ram schools, the development of summer programs and overseeing student mobility and interna internationalisation at the university level at Ashoka University, she seamlessly transitioned into a role dedicated to training and capacity building in schools, research and resource creation, specifically in the realm of college and career counselling with the IC3 Institute. Amrita's journey has equipped her with the skills and experience needed to to now extend support to institutions in her role at Acumen. Her focus will be on bolstering their market presence, fostering meaningful engagements and crafting strategic approaches, all with an unwavering commitment to broadening access and creating abundant opportunities for students on their academic success and fulfillment. So welcome to my panelists. To start off, I'm gonna to throw to you Bhavna. Prior to joining Acumen, you worked for over 19 years at Amity Education Group. Can you tell us a bit about Amity and their international strategy and what role you played in their global engagement success? Thank you, Beck, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world everybody is joining in. Uh, pleasure to be here with all of you. And um, uh, a very, though a very long introduction, Rebecca, I like to call myself a lifelong learner and a student of uh, management science. Uh, and having done that, it was actually got sent that I joined the higher education sector way back in 2003. And coincidentally, I joined Amity, which you have already mentioned, is the place where I worked for 19 years. And never thought I would stay in higher education. I always thought I'd go back to corporate. Having done MBA, you typically look for the corporate life and lots of money that that thing offers. But it was a journey which I started with 120 students at Amity. And when I left Amity 19 years later, there were 180,000 students. 
and I, you can you can visualize that during that transition, I must have learned a lot, which is what excites me always. It was also the advent of privatization in India. Before 2005, there were no private higher education institutions in the country. And hence, I got the opportunity to see how the State Act was actually implemented in India and how the group became one of the first private universities in the country. They always had a very good international vision. And I was a professor of international business. And by virtue of being in academics in the area of international business, I got the opportunity to be mentored by the person who was heading internationalization. Way back in 2003, Amity was looking at twinning, which I did not know as a word at that point of time. But it was a one plus one MBA, and it was something which was credit transfers. I got the opportunity to do moderation of question papers, amazing work in terms of quality assurance, working across borders, spanning the accreditation of their international campuses, multiple MOUs that we signed. Some of them worked. Some of them, many of them, many of them didn't, which I felt was something which could be looked at when I implemented MOUs, you should always have action. So when I when I say management and action, I also say that anything that you sign or agree to do upon should have outcomes. And that is what I continued to learn during 19 years. There were a lot of uh, emphasis on study abroad, short term, three continent programs. Uh, I just... I think got the opportunity to do credit mapping, articulation, understand how things could become restrictive, what could become innovative. It's been a journey that I would love to share uh, as we go along during this webinar. Thanks so much, Bhavna. And to stay with you, just uh, if you could talk a bit about some of the current projects you're working on with Acumen. Well, I was very fortunate to have been a part of the Department of Education Government of Australia project, which again is touching upon how innovative TNE partnerships can be built. It's a project with, that Sanam is, um, that Acumen Sanam S4 is doing across various countries. And I'm looking at the India part of it, bringing my experience of how can I convince Indian institutions to establish better TNE models with Australian institutions. The emphasis has been, it's been a one and a half year journey on this project and lots of learning. We have deliberately not touched upon the usual suspects, as I call them. There are about 55,000 institutions have higher education in the country. And as we all know, the enrollment ratio is very low. There are lots of uh, students who continue to go abroad. Why are the other institutions beyond the top 20 who have been known for establishing TNE partnerships not looking at that? So as a part of the Department of Education project, what we have tried to do is to reach out to the ones which are more willing, to the ones which are more uh, keen on understanding what internationalization can be done and trying to see what different models can be implemented, whether it is in the form of microcredits or some uh, work integrated learning. There have been uh, lots of uh, issues. Everything is never a smooth journey, as with TNE, as possibly most of us have come to realize. Uh, but I think we are working along the way, and soon we should be able to get some good outcomes out of those partnerships. Thank you for sharing that, Bhavna. And I know we're probably going to go into some of the, the challenges a bit later on, so we can go into a bit more of a deeper dive there. Um, and Rita, you recently released a report on the K-12 market in India. Can you tell me a bit about this and some of the key insights that are available in that report? And for those that are watching and, and watching the recording, um, we'll share a link to that report so you can download it yourself. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so having been, and hello to everyone, um, namaste from India. It's good to, you know, see everyone joining in. Um, I think the first, the report was very interesting, was a very interesting project for me because having worked in the school space for 13 years, you don't look at it as holistically as I got the opportunity to look at it, uh, while crafting this report. So some of the things that you should look for in the report is, the increase in the number of schools with international curriculums, the increase in the number of co-educational schools, uh, you know, so very few uh, all boys or all girls schools, more co-educational schools coming up. Um, you should see the number of uh, schools spiking with international curriculums. And that is supported by, you know, expert comments from school leaders in the report where they mention what, why are they looking at international curriculum? And I think looking, reading that up so provides insights to our universities and other schools uh, from outside of the country, you know, to understand what is the need for internationalization, you know, 
um, whether it is in terms of academic delivery, whether it is in terms of exposure, whether it's in terms of the content that they're reading, etc. So uh, I think that's that's been a huge highlight. In addition to the spiking or the increase in the numbers, the report also mentions the regions where such schools are concentrated. So from if I look at it from an outreach perspective, you know, it's a good hint at what regions I could look at, uh, you know, um, that's sort of useful. Um, you'll also see a section in uh, the report on the status of college and career counseling, which reports the increase or the growth in the number of schools that have started to exclusively appoint college and career counselors, uh, which points in the direction of schools wanting to take on that responsibility of what after school, uh, rather than just focus on exams. So creating that system and that mechanism and that support in school. Um, you'll also see some of the changes in which the students are making choices. So um, unlike, you know, two, three years ago when rankings used to be a very top, a high priority, you have more attention being given to program structure, to faculty, and also to safety of the campuses. So, you know, that's a good sort of uh, direction to, you know, sort of look into when you're making your outreach, you know, uh, materials, et cetera. So, you know, that would be useful. A very quick and handy, uh, useful information in the, in the report is also the school calendars. So what are times when, you know, schools have exams? When is the time that, you know, they are uh, open for visits, et cetera. So that's also mentioned. And I think what would be very interesting for everyone here in the audience would be to read the experience of international universities in India. So you have a bite from a UK, US, Australian and Canadian university there, all who've been in the India uh, sector for over about 10 years. So I think seeing, reading what they have to say is, you know, going to be uh, very useful for uh, all the audience here. So those are some of the, it's got a lot more, but those are some of the five, six, uh, you know, points that I could like, that I could, you know, highlight right now. Wonderful. Thank you, Amrita. And look, it is a really interesting read. And of course, if if anyone is reading it and has more questions around it, um, they can reach out to Amrita and she can provide additional insights. Um, what other projects, uh, you know, this K-12 report was wonderful, um, but what other projects are you currently working on with Acumen that you can share? Sure, Rebecca. So I think um, I'll divide that into two. So I think the first are the student facing projects that we're looking at. So um, considering that we represent universities across different regions, I think we're able to pull in academics and different and bring different systems of education, higher learning, et cetera, to students. Um, and I think somewhere we are trying to acknowledge that the students that we interact with, they're 15 to 18 year old. I think as as acumen and as universities working with acumen, we have the responsibility of building their awareness. So we have programs and you know sessions that focus on building awareness, um, understanding of undergraduate choices, um, linking undergraduate choices to jobs, because I think there's been such a linear way of thinking about, okay, if I do physics, then these are the five things that I can do. And the world is changing and you know, sort of becoming more multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. So talking about that. Um, we're also doing, um, you know, what are the careers of the future and trying to do some immersion programs short. So these can be done through um, these. We've actually just done a really successful one on theater and performing arts um, where, you know, the academic was here and uh, we did actually workshops for students and also for teachers. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to do student focused and educator focused. So we do a session with students on a theater technique. That's what we did. So I'm just picking on the example that we, uh, you know, just executed. And then with the educators, we, you know, there was a session done on how do you bring theater to a classroom for better classroom, classroom management or more interaction in class, et cetera. So that's sort of, you know, um, we're trying to increase the touch points within the school uh, and that sort of, and, you know, and, and provide value or professional development um, you know, to the staff and awareness and immersions to uh, students. Uh, we are very fortunate that we are doing this with some of the large group, large educational boards and large groups of schools. Uh, so the outreach or the is you know the reach of these uh, programs is uh, fairly large. 
Uh, and at the educator level, like I said, we're also looking at academic discipline-based engagements. So it could be a masterclass, it could be a competition, uh, both that we have executed uh, recently um, and training and development, uh, the example of which I just gave with the, with the educators. And uh, with university uh, academic delegations, we're looking at, you know, what can they offer and how can that be integrated with the current curriculum or made more relevant uh, to the audience that they're, you know, sort of coming in here. Um, and also may, for a lot of the universities that are coming in recently, uh, helping them un understand the Indian higher education, Indian school system, uh, you know, has been a responsibility and a part of the engagement with universities. Thanks, Amrita. I mean, that program sounds pretty amazing that you do in terms of theatre. What was the sort of feedback from the students? Um, they didn't want it to end. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like um, I know that in two schools, we had teachers telling them that, OK, it's time for the next class. And and in one of the school, we actually had a lunch break after that. So they, we all sat on this big table and, you know, they actually ate with. And of course, the professor we had was also a former actor so they were very like there was that oh my god you know that kind of uh is this real is this for real kind of a moment oh that sounds wonderful um in terms of the you know partnerships in schools in india um why why is it important that you know international universities or in international or other international schools should be investing in developing these strong partnerships Okay, so I'm going to break this down into two parts. One is um, looking at trends, you know, at the uh, at the larger level. That that the international mobility has been at a constant high in the last few years, right? So I think that's a given with the number of students that we have in our country uh, and the choices that they have um, and the aspirations that they have. So there's a growing aspiration for international education. And it's not, it doesn't remain just at the aspiration level. You can see that coming up in mobility reports as well. So outward mobility has been at an all-time high. Second, it's moving beyond STEM programs. Third, it's moving uh, beyond metro cities. Um, so that's at a, at, a, at a sort of a, you know, macro level. Then when you come to a school level, I think, like I mentioned earlier, more number of college and career counselors being available in schools. So the conversation on what you want and the, and the schools wanting to take the responsibility of equipping the students for next steps, uh, that is creating an ecosystem in the schools where there is opportunity for universities to come in and share about programs, share about uh, different countries, uh, share about, you know, what are the possibilities um, and have faculty. So there's suddenly been an open-mindedness and a lot of reception of, you know, um, such kinds of engagements. And the other, the last two points are really about um, being able to, because the school is trying to create that ecosystem where there are, you know, where there like, the field visits that are happening to industry, industry coming in and speaking, et cetera. So um, the universities also have a role to play in that. Um, and I just feel that when you're, when you're working with schools, you're among the teachers, you're among the school management, right? And you're doing it in a place which is um, responsible. You're doing it in a place which is open and transparent. You're doing your activities in a place which um, has an has a sanctity of a educational environment, of a responsible education environment. You have the reach of a higher number of students. Uh, you're doing it in a classroom situation. So there are lots of conversations that are building, which you can sort of address, you know, as opposed to outside a school system where there may be individual conversations. So I think the quality of conversation that you can build and the quality of input that you can build in a classroom situation um, with the presence of educators, with the presence and the relationships you can build with counselors and sort of be in that circle of visibility, which gradually grows to a circle of influence is what I would say. And being present in a, in a school then is 
then even if they hear of you outside of a school, you know, it sort of reinforces uh, your presence or consolidates uh, the presence. Uh, so I would say uh, engaging in schools is uh, is more, it can be deeper, can be more meaningful, can be larger number of students, uh, but can be and but can be very purpose driven. Um, so that's that's where I and I think it's a very clean place to build your brand visibility. But I I just want to put a disclaimer and a rider there that it comes with a lot of responsibility. Uh, and I think uh, everyone involved in that space should honor uh, that sense of responsibility while working in schools. Yeah, I completely agree, Amrita, that respect that you have to build and that trust that you need to build with each of those individual schools, because it is that two-way giving, you know, you're not going in there and just, it's a, not a single transaction. So investing in that long-term um, partnership is is super important. Thanks for some of those great tips there. Um, Bhavna, similarly with, with universities India in India, how do you create long-lasting partnerships? Well, I have seen some very good long-lasting partnerships in India. So definitely it can be done is my first takeaway. And actually some of them date back again to 2003, as I have mentioned. And they were also all areas of partnerships, not only the typical student mobility in terms of partnership or the progression or recruitment, but also deeper engagement. In fact, I still remember New Colombo Plan has been very successful with some of the universities in Australia, for example. And there was a lot of excitement when we got our first batch of 30 students. Again, this is 2006 I'm talking about. And we played cricket together. And it, 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 I mean, I'm not mentioning the World Cup here. So not that, but at that time, I think I remember we won, or I can at least say who was checking, right? <laughs> but it was, it was bringing that students together. And we, in India, keep on talking about there is no inward student mobility. I've seen those student mobility happen. If there's an inward student mobility, deeper faculty engagement, just as Amrita was mentioning, a faculty coming and talking to students in a school, that's the best way to build that brand recognition, interest in the professors. In India, there has this urge of going abroad has traditionally, we know, been restricted to some other countries. And why is that? Because other ones have not possibly been branded so well. They, you don't even know what they can offer. You don't even know the kind of research environments that they offer. So the depth of the partnership, in my opinion, can be looked at from all lenses. The typical ones, demographic, you understand what politics is happening, social, economic, and hence you need that local expertise. India by itself is 28 states and each one of them is no less than a country. So I'm not saying that we ourselves are experts in all the areas in that. So you do need that concurrent uh, understanding of what is happening in terms of regulations, et cetera. But beyond that, there are always so many areas through which that partnership could be nurtured and developed. Another example that I remember coincidentally is also an Australian university. And this was in 2009, and there was a group of 30 MBA, executive MBA students who traveled with a professor from QUT in Australia and came to us, and they wanted to have a live simulation competition. And I remember the moot court, which is the law college court, of course, it was transformed into these groups of students sitting together, having lots of fun and cracking a live case study of management and just build those connections to a deeper level. It brought those faculty to the extent of being able to co-author a research paper together. So obviously, we are talking about articulation, twinning, dual degree, joint degree, every, everybody aims for that. But there are so many ways in which you can create those stronger connection, which by themselves will give you that progression mobility. The students who would have participated in these case studies, they traveled with teams going to attend a Jaipur Literary Festival as a part of NCP. They tackled each other in a live case study competition. They obviously got interest. Oh, how can I now go and do a master's in uh, Australia? Or can I do my master's in New Zealand? If they know the kind of quality which is being done, if they if students to student interaction, whether it is in terms of hackathons, COVID has shown us that the world can be a light pace. Look at us. We are from across the world and we are having this nice conversation, right? Virtual internships are an amazing idea to capture that interest. And especially in the, in the areas where you can do virtual internships, I'm not saying that you can do it in everything, but I have seen labs also become very virtual these days. So there is, you if you capture that interest of a student who's always looking for where do I spend my summer, 
meaningfully, you know. And if you give them that opportunity to be able to just have a conversation with some student in your university, some faculty in your university, you automatically bring that bridge of the gap and you come to know of the students care. And obviously, the other areas are you you should know what's happening in terms of uh, the new entrants, the competition coming up, uh, what others are doing, what kinds of partnerships have worked, what cannot work, what may work for one may not work for you. So your vision, your strategy is known to yourself only. And if you know what you're looking for, is it numbers, is it quality, is it research, is it innovation, is it joint patents, is it summer exchange, is it student exchange, you look at that gamut of internationalization of higher education and you pick out what fits into your strategic plan. And believe me, in this 1.4 billion population of the world, there is an opportunity for each one of them. Thanks, Bhavna. You picked on a really good point there about understand your own your own institution strategic plan and making sure what you're going to do those activities are going to align to that um and i think one of the other things that's you know so important about that consistency and your your regular engagement and and committing and delivering on things that you you say that you're going to um as an important part now talking about some successful cases there with qut you know sound like a great um great initiative. Um, what are some of the challenges out there when it comes to uh, dealing with foreign institutions within India um, and how some examples of how this could be overcome? So there are the obvious uh, roadblocks in terms of the local knowledge and cultural knowledge, mapping of the mutual recognition of qualifications when you're talking of credit transfers. We are still working in a world where, especially in India, where A has to be an A and a B has to be an A. You, you cannot compare an apple with an orange, whereas I feel that you should start comparing learning outcomes more. And if you stick to the fact, oh, the student, so I remember a student who had gone and started in one of the top 100 QS universities, and the university refused to take back the credits to India. And I had a tough time fighting why can a student who's top in a top 100, you are not in top 100, this is some other case study, and you, you, you refuse to recognize the credits from there and you make the poor person go through another semester, another credits, etc. So, but, but that reality has to be understood. There has to be a means in which you sit down and have that fair and important discussion. It's possible. The, the, the reason why these conversations occur is because there has been a typical demarcation, in my opinion, between academics and international offices. And being a part of both, I am very passionate to see how we bring them together, especially in India. You, you cannot say that an international office doesn't know what the faculty wants and the faculty says oh, the international office has a different thing. The, unless the two and two work together, the international office can sign multiple MOUs and that's where I've seen. Two vice chancellors meet, they get very excited on a plane, they sign a lot of MOUs, they come back and none of the faculty end up doing anything. Which is not the point, right? So you you may have that, but you need those, those ground people to also look at uh, what is happening. And if I mentioned some of the things that I've seen very successfully happen is the fact that India also wants to evolve in terms of curriculum. Some of the recent case studies, again, I'm referring to interesting example of Melbourne, which I'm particularly fond of. They've been able to crack a BSc blended program in Amity, which I'm very, which I'm very uh, fond of because it's not worried about academic mapping. It's not worried about the curriculum mapping. They have mentored, they have given an academic mentoring of the curriculum. University in uh, north of India, Chitkara, has also adopted the same model. They have formed deeper dual degree partnerships, but they have not gone into the advent of curriculum mapping. They have said that in the first two years, we will be mentored in terms of academic delivery by the partner institution. So people are finding ways. I'm not saying that's the best solution because not always does that work, but there are ways in which you can make that work. And I have seen examples of how that could have been done. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and it is funny, you know, you talk about the faculties going off and signing MOUs and the amount of times I've heard that with, with institutions and then they have to spend all that time going through and 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 I guess cancelling some of those MOUs or looking at them again Um yeah, it's making sure you have that strong partnership between the international team and and the faculty as well. Um, thinking about parents now uh, and the parents in India, I guess this one, Amrita, I'll, I'll start with you. What what role do parents play, and how do you connect with them, and how important are they in India? I don't know if it's a question. It's a, if it's a valid question, Rebecca, the world knows about Indian parents. So, um, well, I think traditionally, historically, culturally, um, parents are the most important influencing agency or, you know, the significant 
uh, with significant influence. So it's actually interesting uh, from a survey that we did last year where I was in my previous organization where we asked about the level of influence, both to both what parents think they have on their uh, kids and what kids think their parents have on them, right? So uh, we asked the parents and the parents reported on a scale of one to 10, having an influence of 6.33, which is considered, which was the highest. Yeah. And the students reported that figure to be 6.63. So not only is there an influence, there is also an acceptance of that influence or a very, uh, yeah. However, what is interesting is that, um, after this question, we asked that, okay, do you feel that you have, can have a conversation? Is the influence one way, right? Or is there a, is there a, is there freedom or is there, is this more conversational, uh, you know, etc. So of course they did say that they are, the students said that they are given maximum, the kids said that they have maximum freedom in choosing a course of study. Um, whereas parents decide have more influence on the country of study, right? So it's interesting because I guess that is uh, coming from um, the, a budget angle, maybe from a budget and a safety angle, which parents may play, uh, place more emphasis on. Um, and another dynamic to this is actually when we asked parents about how, you know, what do they think is the most useful information for you as a parent in a university session, they said academic program details, and I'm, that's 55.72%. Potential job opportunities, which was 46.92%, and safety, which was 34.11%. Okay. So um, it's very interesting to see this sort of um, pattern. Um, and also, there is this whole space where every where students and parents are discussing more about the program, right, which is clear. So um, I guess it's time to sort of, uh, and when, when we ask students that, where do you think you are ready to accept their point of view? Or, you know, where do you think, what do they, what do you think they need to learn more about? Your parents need to learn more about. So they spoke about careers of the future, right? Or they spoke about uh, parents, you know, students said that they need to understand courses more because we, you know, parents have grown up in an era of linear education. And now, um, you know, when they have students making different choices, even in school, I saw that when I was at school, traditionally, when I remember when I started my career in a school back in 2006, seven, we used to have streams, right? Science stream, commerce or business stream and arts and humanities. In a lot of schools, that's not the case any longer. So it's, you can choose a science a humanities and a business subject together, right? So even at the school level, when we used to advise on choices or when we used to have that week of uh, picking subjects, right? Parents were like, okay, but what is going to happen if he does this, isn't this, you know? So I think there's starting from that point and then, okay, where does that lead to? That is the area where there is a lot of, so when you say, how do you connect? How do you make sense to parents? It's really talking about, okay, you know, this, what do you think? Like we do this with kids also in some of our sessions that this person is a CEO of this company or this person is an athlete. What do you think they studied in college? So is there a link to education and to what you do? Is there a link only for the first job? Is that link? And also this is very personal, right? So um, for different people, it could mean different things, but just to help them understand that there is a world of possibilities and to help them understand that they can do this with much lesser stress and pressure than, you know, uh, they sort of put, th that families put on themselves or children put on themselves knowingly, unknowingly, right? So I think when I talk about parents, it's really about educating them about what is the world of education and higher learning today? What are the kind of possibilities it's leading to? Because parents are freaking out. They're like, every kid says, I want to be a YouTuber, okay? So, um, Yes, well, you can be, but uh, do you need to study? And then you have organizations that come up and say, we are not looking at academic qualifications as we are hiring, etc. So there's a whole world that's, you know, there are different voices and there's a lot of noise. But I think how do you join hands with parents to talk about um, potential outcomes and that there could be different routes to the same destination?
right and they and they could they could be chosen at different points some decisions will make me you know how can you stagger the decision making i think that is helpful for parents the other thing that's really helpful for parents is about financial planning uh, for higher education um and breaking some of the um stereotypes like i said of uh, outcomes right and i think uh, constantly re um, re sort of thinking about the conversation on roi because when it comes to international education i think everyone sort of tends to get stuck on one or two things but if we can open up that conversation a little bit you know more and look at it more holistically is what i'd say would touch a chord with a parent and if Thanks you say how do you en- sorry if you say how do you engage with them please go to schools <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I read one of the interesting points that you made. I, I haven't really thought too much about that, but it's about educating about the education system um, and how that is changing and what that impact is on a f- the future career of their child. And Bhavna, I don't know if you want to add some comments because I know we talked about this, but as you know, as a parent yourself, you kind of had a few thoughts around this. Yeah, yeah, no. So I uh, see the, of course, the role of a parent uh, in the school system and the ability for you to draw parents in schools is typically different from when you look at universities. And there's a sudden change in the students' behavior. So you are able to draw in a lot of parents in the conversation when you are trying to reach out in schools. But when you try to do the same in universities, it becomes limited. But that said, uh, without the engagement part, because I've I'm a parent who's had two children put through university. So I completely endorse what uh, Amrita said. And uh, having seen that thing myself, it's also governed a lot by the society we live in and parents in India are, because they are the financiers. The parents uh, finance the child's education, even till doctorate sometimes. So not only undergraduate. And if the funding is by the, there is a certain segment of the parents today which is more aware, having gone through their own cycle, and you see that more definitely in 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 the in the tire one in the metro in Delhi where I live, where uh, parents have suddenly become. We had to go through this. Our parents should be, and they've suddenly I think become more free. They have become more open. They are looking at universities and institutions, which is why you see the new ones, the liberal ones, having gained so much of traction in India, because. There is that limitation in terms of the capacity of Indian market. We say we want to achieve a target of 50% gross enrollment ratio, but where are the institutions and what parents have started questioning now? And hence, it was actually, by the way, a group of parents which came together and built the Ashoka University, which where my daughter is a student right now, so, which is also a very phenomenal change in the way things are happening. It's a group which has said, we went to XYZ country and came back. Why cannot we give the same thing here? And they are looking for seeing those kind of partnerships. They're looking for seeing those kind of things. You have institutions like ISB, which is welcoming faculty to come and teach here. And these have been parents in those traditional socially, I, I don't want to use any other negative word, but in, in the way they were traditionally driven by, you have to do, you have to become a doctor and an engineer. I don't know why that is the reason why I'm an engineer, but possibly if I had had a chance of being something else, I would have chosen a diverse basket that Amrita was referring to and not a typical physics, chemistry, maths, bio that I did. Thanks. Thanks, Vavda. And and look, Amrita, I'm just going to go back, you know, about, you, know, you said go to the schools, um, but there is that myth around, you know, school counsellors don't want to be contacted by foreign universities. Um, so so what role does the school counsellor play and, and how influential are they? And do they want people to come and see them? Yeah, so I'd say it's a myth. Like you said, it's a myth. So let's just leave it at that. I think most counsellors uh, want to interact, want to learn more. Um, and I can tell you that in the era that I was at the Sriram school, we initially had universities saying that, okay, how many kids will be there to a point where universities were even open to just coming to meet the counselor to have a conversation. So I think setting the right time, um, setting, I mean, getting them at the right time, uh, getting your communication right of what your intent is and what are you really trying to do. So I think uh, that's very important. Um, timing is important communication and intent is important having patience is important when you're trying to uh, you know sort of access uh, schools Um, and when I come to 
so how much what i mean what what can counselors do in schools or you know i i wouldn't like to say their level of influence but just the work that they're doing and what it's leading to again i'm going to go back on the survey and say that you know students who uh, were asked to rate their usefulness uh, of the conversations they've had with uh, counselors on a scale of you know um, 1 to 10 78.63% uh, of the students reported that uh, usefulness to be above 5 right in the, and uh, and those who said they, they were a, a large majority of that also out of that 78.63% said rated it above 6.96 .6, indicating very useful um the areas where counselors support has been found most useful uh, by students is understanding and analyzing personal strengths and weaknesses shortlisting universities and courses so you see it's coming back to uh, that whether it is from a parent angle whether it's from a student angle or a counselor angle uh, and of course in advising on you know how can they build their profile and how can they build their readiness for college so um, I think it's you know that's where I would say um, and really, like I said, that uh, engagements with schools has to be purpose driven. Uh, and, you know, I find that's a skill to be built, you know, when uh, as a university or as an in-country representative when you're working with schools. Uh, but yes, they love to meet uh, different countries, different kinds of schools, you know, different kinds of universities. I wouldn't shy away from saying that um, uh, there is a... So then sometimes maybe a hierarchy to say that, you know, which may be governed by rankings, which may be governed by uh, popularity of that destination for the school students there. So if I'm a, a school uh, and I have 80% of my students going to the US, it could mean two things for me that I need to call more US universities in my calendar. So in my calendar, I'll have more time for US universities. Or it will. It could also inform me that maybe I'm not providing adequate exposure to other countries. So then it's really up to how you have that conversation with the counselor, or you know, say. So it's about really engaging by asking them, what is the you know what is the demographic, what are the kind of choices, uh, and building on that relationship. Uh, but yeah, going there to learn and going there to understand rather than going there to say, hey, this is what we have in the first instance, you know. So I think um, that's that's where I'd leave it to. Thanks, Amrita. Um, I'm very mindful. We've actually only got two minutes left. So this time just flew right past. Um, so I, it's, it's over to both of you for a last bit of advice to institutions that are about to start exploring international um, partnerships in India. Um, what's some advice that you would give to them? Bhavna, I'll go with you first. I, I think... Uh... Everybody, the world is talking about India and we are talking about the world. So, and the mission is we want to bring the world to India and take India to the world. And I think uh, everybody around the world is saying that. So the opportunity is definitely there. There are a number of uh, strengths as well. There are a number of unexplored areas. There are a number of uh, willing people. There are a number of teams on the ground which really want to do something, have the urge to do something, and all stakeholders, whether we are talking about the parents or international officers or academicians or teachers or study abroad agents or ed tech companies which have suddenly come in, the opportunities are endless and innovation is going to be the key. And I feel that as long as you, you just have to persevere. When we specifically when you talk about TNE, uh, I think with all possible models that I have seen, whether in your personal or professional or corporate or your own mission, you really have to understand what you want in life. So what Amrita was saying, you, what do you want in life? And again, the routes to reaching that, if we can say the same for students and universities alike, may be different, but there are uh, equal number of ways. And who knows an innovative practices that has already been followed in Australia and New Zealand could bring in that change in India that we have been looking for. Thanks, Bhavna. And Amrita, last advice from you? Yeah, so just three points. I think be uh, picking and very similar to Bhavna. So I think be experimental like the kids are being these days. Uh, more open to, uh, you know, trying out and, uh, um, but of course, looking at your resources, at uh, you know, uh, in this whole process. Um, 
be patient, have a long-term vision of what I need to do in six months. Maybe I, for the first six months, I need to just understand the market. Then my one-year goal would be one region and five schools or 10 schools, right? And then a three-year plan and then a five-year plan. So have a long-term vision, which can be supported by a, a robust plan, uh, which includes identifying the right regions, the right kind of institutions, However, the core of it is really what is the intent and what is the purpose and, uh, you know, uh, really sort of consolidate that and be open to that conversation. Have fun while doing it. Um, and like I said, experiment a little bit more. And just, uh, yes. just to add, Ritha, after the K-12 report, which Amrita has done, uh, just look out for we are coming up with a deep dive into the states of India. And the first one is supposed to come out uh, early next month. And we've also tried to go down and make more sense out of the 28 states and equivalent to 28 countries. Um, and those could also be some good insights to look out for. And feel free to reach us if you have any questions after that. Good point, Pavna. Thank you for, for raising that. Um, well, with that, we've gone one minute over. Um, so a big thank you to both Amrita and Bhavna. This has been a wonderful conversation to have, and I hope everyone got a lot of insights, advice, um, tips and tricks from you both. Um, so thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. <laughs> See you later. Thank you.